Thank you very much. I'm Malta Rasmussen. I work for Arm. I have been toying a little bit with the big little for about a decade. Um, I'll do this first. Today I want to raise a discussion around energy model accuracy. Um, it has sort of come up in, in, in various discussions over the last few days. Um, so I, I think we might have something to talk about here. So just to motivate it a little bit. So in the Linux kernel we have an energy model. It was put in there to be used by, uh, by NGOS scheduling. This is a very crude representation of, of what an energy model really is. It's just a table. We have one for each type of CPU in the system. And for each frequency supported by that CPU, we have an entry that describes our compute capacity, which is really throughput, how much work do we get done at this frequency, and there is a power number. And the assumption in there is that the amount of work we've done at a specific frequency is, is the same no matter what we're doing and the power is the same no matter what we're doing. And clearly that's not really a valid assumption, but that's where we started because we needed Which to have something. Uh, it's um, the purple one. It's a purple one. The model I'm showing here is actually like. taken off a shipping Android device, so it's not entirely made up. So this is what it looks like on a real device. All the points on the curves are the frequency supported and the three colors represent the three types of uh, we have on, on that particular device. So the history, as I said, the energy model was introduced with energy OS scheduling, and the reason why we have it is that it enables us to make predictions about where we can place tasks, how efficient will it run, we can take things into account like DBFS, on, especially on ARM systems, we quite often share the the, uh, the clock on, um, across a number of CPUs, so if you mix and match with high compute demand or low compute demand, then the energy model will tell you that's a bad idea because then you're executing at a high frequency, which is very expensive. So, by having this energy model in there, we can make better decisions about where to run tasks. And as I said before, currently it's static data, so it's a, it's a static compute capacity and it's a static power number. Um, which was okay when we started doing this because when we started doing this, Big Little was just two types of cores and they were quite Where different. The Reality today is that we're no longer no. just big little system, okay. we have what we call tri gear, so we have big medium little, and to make things even worse, most systems are designed such that the mediums and the bigs are fairly close, which means that the big margins we had originally of 20% for any comparison we did, they're way too big because the difference between medium and big is often way less than 20%. Um, is there a question? Lukash? Yeah, Lukash. Have questions? Yeah. If you have questions, let us know in the chat. Right. Okay. Please share again if you have something to say. Um, so really we have a problem that there is a demand for having higher accuracy for our predictions in the air, which means that the model needs to be more accurate. Um, and just to highlight the problem, I have benchmarked on a real device again, the same one as we got the, the energy model from before. And these are four different benchmarks where I've done a full sweep of all DBFS points and all the, all the CPU types. Um, and these are the power performance curves you get out of that. Yeah, going down. And as you can see, some of them look a bit yeah, like the energy model we showed you before, and some of them are vastly uh, different. I think, yeah, I've seen it. And that means so when we correct. are making decisions in EAS, and we, we, we have something running on one CPU, and we think, okay, it, it fits here, or it doesn't fit here anymore, now we need to reason about it, can it run better on a different one? Um, if, the, uh, if the capacity is wrong, we can end up actually evaluating the wrong OPP uh, or the wrong wrong entry in our energy model when, when we try to uh, to make that comparison. Um, so we can end up making quite wrong decisions. So how do we fix this? 
So I just want to show here that if we look at things like just like the, the capacity of trying to, to indicate that this is at a different point. So everything here is normalized to the capacity of, of, the, of the biggest CPU, of course. But what we can see is that the top OPP of the, the middle CPU, the performance on, on, on that OPP can vary by something like 50% of the what you do. And if we look at the power, it can vary by something like 20%. So the peak power on our biggest CPU can vary by something like 20%. Okay. They, they are online, they don't have the same... So, no. okay. what can we do about this? Okay. Um, first of all, I think we should remember where the energy model came from. It came from, we wanted to use it to make relative comparisons in, uh, in, in EAS when we make task placement decisions. Uh, it was not really designed to make accurate predictions about the absolute power of the CPU. Um, so be aware of that. I know the energy model is used in, uh, in IPA, for example, uh, to do this. So just be careful if you don't have a good feedback loop to, to correct any errors you, you generate by using the energy model we have today, then you might get something that's really wrong. Um, so what can we do to make it more accurate? Should we, uh, should we add some scaling factors that try to take things into account, like the task profile, things like temperature? There was a discussion yesterday that I couldn't attend in the, in the Android Micro Conference about the temperature influence on, on, the, on the energy model. When the system heats up, some of the curves shift, and, and, um, and suddenly some OPPs become more efficient than others. Or should we dynamically update the whole energy model? Or should we just pretend the problem is not there? But yeah, for now they can't hear anything, so I'm not sure we have to use that. They're working. They don't have the, the audio on their line. They are working on fixing it. Oh, I see. But, uh, no, they just have maybe I pop into the mic. Um, well, in, in all the um, tests that you have done, have you seen kind of relationship between the IPC and the variation, or that's completely random? I mean, the, the different use cases that you have run there, have you been able to make any kind of relation with the, with the number of instructions? There, there, there can be all sorts of reasons why they don't show the same behavior. Yeah. For example, number three over there, you see that it doesn't scale very well with frequency. Yeah. That's probably because it's memory bound. Okay. So it doesn't help making your CPU run any faster if your bottleneck is your memory system. Yeah. Um, this is where we get stuck. And then there are other things that might kick in, but yes, there is a difference in IPC. Uh, generally, if you have the um, the medium and the uh, the big core being closer together, it's because you can't achieve the best possible IPC on the on the big core, and that could be for a ton of reasons. It can be, yeah, the instruction makes you have all the, the control flow you have. If you have lots of branches, particularly mispredicted branches, then you get a bad IPC on the, on a, on, a, on a core that would otherwise have an IPC of perhaps three or four or five. Um. Um, then that's, then that's not, not very efficient, efficient because, because then you have a big fat pipeline, pipeline, pipeline sitting, sitting and doing nothing because, nothing because you can't fill it up with anything useful to do because you constantly get it flushed because of the branch mispredicts or, or other things. But that's why you see all those variations. One question and I guess one additional point. Um, I'm assuming when you did this, you kind of maxed out the memory frequencies so that that's not kind of playing into your performance numbers or capacity numbers? Sorry, again, there is a bit of echo. Um, did you max out the DDR or RAM frequency when you ran these tests so that that's not adding a variation to the capacity? No, I use the device as is because I don't have access to, to mess with the firmware on, on this, uh, this shipping device. So all I did was that I, I, I fixed all the frequencies, what I did on this particular setup was that all other frequencies than all other, all other CPUs than the one that I was currently measuring, I picked at the minimum frequency, and then I just used uh, setting the max frequency for the one that I, will, uh, that I was measuring. 
Okay, so, so maybe, I guess that's another variability for the capacity. If if it's not reacting fast enough, the DDR scaling algorithms or governors. Yeah. So these these are benchmarks that run between half a second and ten seconds. Okay. So I, I think any policy that would have to adapt would have had some time to do that. This is a very popular benchmark in mobile, so I'm sure the system is optimized. For okay. <laughs> I forgot the other point. I'll ask for the mic when I remember it again. I think one thing is clear for us that we can't overwhelm the, our customers or our users to provide like a more specific energy model because currently we already have, we just ask for those tuples, uh, frequency power, and some of them are already overwhelmed. So we can't probably have like a multi dimension dimensional energy model to take this into consideration for instance. So there must be something else, uh, like a two-step two process, like having the, the old energy model also to cover legacy, and then, you know, in, in, in the decision direction from energy model to task placement, for instance, there has to be an entity in the middle uh, providing, <clears throat> like, uh, yeah, information to, to tweak the, the, the capacity utilization characteristics, which comes out, out of the normal static energy model, I guess. Yeah. Uh, one way to go would be to stay with, with the energy model we have as a sort of an average energy model, and then have some additional information we can use to, to, to overlay or, or modify that. So if you had hardware hints, you could, in theory, multiply your, uh, your capacities with whatever is being, being, uh, being, being classified. The stuff you presented yesterday, the um, the um, hardware feedback interface you have on Intel, could in theory modify the capacities on the fly. Do you have a, an energy meter on your hardware? Um, on this particular device, there is the possibility of measuring uh, energy. We don't in general. We don't have an architected one. Yeah, because I think the ultimate solution to this would be you know, to make the target resilient to what's running and have it build the model on the fly by measuring itself. And, and it will just detect that it's now draws this curve and then it would take some measurements and say, oh, well, that's not what we're doing now. Now we're on this curve and the model has just changed. Yeah, so, so we could, could flip the whole or replace the whole model depending on what workload we're running. Or really generate it on the fly, yeah. Yeah, but to generate it on the fly, you would you have, have to, to, to sort of sweep all your... Well, the, it would be easy for a uniprocessor, right? But yeah. the hard part is, okay, now you've got, you know, a bunch of processors and they're all at different operating points and you'd have to, because they all have effect on each other, right? Yeah. But the nice thing about that is that you wouldn't, you would be immune to things that you couldn't possibly know in the energy model, like, gee, on this SOC, they tied two voltage rails together or, or yeah. something like that, right? And you would just say, well, it's, it's, this is what we see. So this is what it is. It's always going to be, be right. But for that, you'd need a, you'd need a, an energy meter and we don't have one. We have an energy meter, but it doesn't, it's not very good at the low power levels. It's only good because it's really designed to tell turbo where to stop. It's really up by TDP where it's, it's right on, but down by, you know, under a watt, forget about it. It's just, all it tells you is you're under a watt and it's swinging all over the place. Mm -hmm. But if we, in general, had a power meter that could go down to the interesting, through the whole part of the curve, I think the ultimate solution would be to, to use it. Yeah. Would it solve the problem where you would have tasks of different behavior? I mean, if you have two tons running on your systems and they'd have wildly different... It is problems. what it is. Yeah, you you know, it's... Of course, you're predicting, as always, that the near future is going to be similar to the recent past, mm -hmm. and you and, and we'll be wrong, but it will self-correct, just like everything else we do, right? Somebody could be running this weird ISO that's way the right curve. Somebody else could be running the one on the left. They could switch between the two, but it would adapt, and so yeah, we continuously you, update the model. But you can kind of need both at the same time, right? Because if if you're having one task that behaves like the one on the right and one that behaves like the one on the left. Could it fight? Yeah, that's a good question. Because in theory, what we could do is that if we allow the energy model to be updated at runtime, we could do something horrible in Android and say, if the vendor detects that you're doing 
whatever, then they just go in from user space and say, now we replace the energy model with this because I know this workload works a lot better with this. That might be a start. But it doesn't solve the problem if you have a task that's behaving like the one to the right and another one that behaves like the one to the left and you want to place them both the best possible way at the same time. Right. You'd, we're, we're, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you, can you classify uh, the task? Do you, can we use the PMU or anything else new in ARM, like uh, for Intel to classify the, the class to be more memory bonded, CPU bonded? Potentially we could. Yeah. No, that, that because it it's looks like that could be a good uh, new input to, I would say, scale a bit your power consumption. Yeah. Clearly, if you're memory bonded, I mean, uh, highest frequency is just waste of power compared to the, the capacity. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I did some experiments on something like that before. The problem with that, the workload changes so fast. Like there are sections of code that's kind of memory bound, and then afterwards it's not, or things are moved into the cache. By the time you try to correct for it, and you say oh, it no longer needs the max frequency, it's actually running code that's going to be more compute bound, and it's like it is a mess. You mean in, inside? Trying to trying to correct it at runtime. Huh? We we have the same problem because our hardware classifier is extremely fast, and so it's saying this, that, this, that, and what we need to do is normalize that to the scheduler's notion of how often it can place a task, which is. I don't care what you've done the last 10 microseconds. I want to know what you've done the last 10 milliseconds because it can take me a couple of milliseconds to move you. I did it in the 10 millisecond range. Even then the problem was that if five of those milliseconds you're running fully compute bound, you have suddenly lost like 3% or 5% of your performance because you would have allowed it to go to a max frequency, but because of this averaging, you don't allow it to do it. That is becoming, so we just gonna, it's fine. We'll take the hit on power. Um, so the other point is like, I think the workload, I'm just kind of spitballing here too. But to me, I'm kind of more leaning towards doing it on a workload basis or a thread basis that you can say maybe for these kind of threads, this is going to be the memory model. You can try to measure and kind of put them one way or another, just setting one energy model. I'm not sure how much better it's going to be compared to what we have today. Except for the thermal case, I see, but but that could just be like a dynamic correction you could do. You don't need like two separate curves drawn. Um, you could just say just above this value, increase it by twenty percent or something like that. Yeah, I agree that that for thermal, it's it's not it's not a, a problem that each task is different, and therefore you can just update the energy model dynamically. So that would be fairly straightforward. Uh, yeah, I think the tricky bit is 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 is. Uh, is addressing this issue. I think for this issue, if you're, if you're trying to fix it, I think we should just go with per thread. Otherwise we are like, I mean, we're trying to improve, but not really improving it. It's like, but all that work for not giving much of an improvement, kind of. Yeah. So uh, ultimately we seem to be leaning towards a solution where each task has its own collection of characteristics. And then when it gets scheduled, then we adjust to, the, to what it's doing or it has been doing recently, right? Something like that. Yeah, well, at least you can use it to adjust the performance to be more like your, your, your performance axis is moving not more the, the power, it's just that you're stretching or not the performance range. So maybe that can be used as an input. Just uh, instead of using a normalized performance value, when you're computing the power, you can just stress, stretch like that. I don't know. Sorry, again, stretch it based on, on what? No, it's just that if you look at that, it seems that, that I would be curious, but the power, the power range is the same. It's just that the performance yeah is either really small yeah. in case of memory bonded, the range is really small because we don't care about, or it's really large. So if you're able to know if your task is memory or CPU bonded in your ES, when you're taking your energy model, the performance you can, or the ES, maybe the performance, you can scale the performance according to your current. Oh, um, we are back to the number of instructions per cycle. 
Yeah, it, it is really that you would like to, I mean, on the x-axis, we can fix it by if we, if we somehow knew that if we're running on a medium CPU and our IPC is X, then if we can predict that the IPC is going to be Y on the yeah. on the on the biggest CPU, then yeah. we can compensate for this uh, error we have on the on the capacity estimate. Maybe that's the one that can be learned, like Len was saying. Maybe you could learn that value because at some point, if you leave the default energy model, you you're likely maybe you'd migrate to big. And then you realize how the IP isn't what I thought it was. It almost feels like you need per thread arch scale, maybe. Right? I remember someone asked me if the PMU was uh, efficient on ARM64. If we can use that all the time, if we can reserve one channel. Uh, we can't use the PMU all the time because it's reserved for, for debugging purposes, but we do have counters. PMU? That give us a few things on ARM. We have instruction to retire yeah. it. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so things like that. That was the question. Yeah. And we just say, okay, we we keep one counter for the scheduler or the thread running currently mm -hmm. on the CPU. We could do that, but whether we can use that information to predict what will happen on a different core, I think that's that's the tricky bit. Because just because you have a lo low IPC on one microarchitecture doesn't mean that you have a high or a similar IPC on a different one. That, no, but you you, you, on you know what is the max IPC per core? Mm -hmm. So you know how efficient you are. I mean, how, how many stall cycle you have right now in the in what you have to do. So you can predict. Even if on, let's say that on the the low core you are below, you have a low IPC. It means that it's really a memory bonded. So you know that even no, going that's on not. The, I mean, well, this true for memory bond, you would have yeah. lower IPC. But I don't think you can just make the generic assumption. But, no, one, one more thing. One, one more thing. I, I think that you you really care about asymptotic behavior, and not about momentary behavior, because that will that can change all the time. You know, it if if the system is noisy, then you can't do much about that anyway, right? Because it will be noisy. Yeah, you will have a lot of random stuff. If it's kind of stabilized, mm -hmm. you want to avoid having a, a pessimistic case there, right? You want to like, if it gets bad asymptotically, you you want to move away from that state. Yes. Essentially. Yes. And that's what all of that should be used for. Uh, so, so that that's that's your target basically that avoiding the case where you have totally off the, the system is totally off it could yeah, be much but, better than this but how do you detect that you're off oh that's a good question <laughs> but 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 this is really the the, the, the interesting case because otherwise mm -hmm. you are you, you cannot help the the noisy yeah, situation. I, I, I think there are only really two parts. Either you have something, some counters that can help you tell you when you're off or enable you to do this correction of what is your, your true throughput, some kind of IPC uh, prediction. Yeah, yeah you, need or, to, you need to be more monitoring things. That, that That's for sure. Yeah. yeah, this way or another. Or you could cheat. You could just know, like we already talked about yeah. verticals, and you could say, oh, I know I'm running this app on Android and it's going to be box number three, and you don't really need box number three, you're just going to tweak the X into a single model, and mm -hmm. and and that's that's the tweak. It tweaks to the input to the model, Yeah, which I think is a good observation. Uh, so we are running out of time for this topic, do I? Oh, yeah, I think I'm right. Yeah, we, we, we're out of time. I just wanted so... to throw the problem out there so people are aware that don't trust the energy model too much on a modern <laughs> system. Um, and think about how we can actually improve it. Okay. Yep. Thank Sounds you. good. Thank you.